Hey everybody, have you ever played a game that really made you scratch your head and say, WTF? Not because it was like confusing or the, the story had plot holes in it or anything like that, just because it's so unbelievably odd that you're not quite really sure what you're looking at? That's what we're going to be talking about today when D-Pad Danny does weird games. Incredible Crisis for the PlayStation. It's a really strange game. I mean, obviously, or I wouldn't be talking about it in this episode. It's Grandma's 80th birthday, and she wants the whole family home in time for dinner. Seems like a reasonable request, right? So with that, the family members each go about their day. The game is basically a collection of mini-games in the form of the weird and bizarre things that happen to this family. These games range from frantic button mashers to brain-teasing logic puzzles and rhythm games that test your timing. You begin with the father at his desk job. Shortly after concluding the daily office exercises, the construction crew outside drops this giant stone ball and it's coming right for you. After escaping it down the hall, in the elevator, and out the window, falling multiple floors and freely sticking the landing, it seems you're safe. For now. After a while you encounter this lady who seems to have an ulterior motive. She lures you into a ferris wheel ride and she requires a back massage. Dad, you dog. After, uh, being satisfied, she leaves a bomb for you to enjoy. Worst first date ever. Then for some reason you find yourself in the harbor shooting down government rockets that are headed for an alien mothership. How did the storyline take us here? The mom's story has her running errands and inadvertently walking into a bank heist in progress. After being forced to assist the criminals in their robbery, you end up piloting a fighter jet because, man, you gotta get home and start dinner. Naturally, the only course of progression from there is taking down a giant teddy bear that's terrorizing the city. The son's story is interesting but short. He's zapped with some sort of shrinking ray and he needs to escape a killer praying mantis and avoid becoming lunch for a hungry antlion. Why isn't this kid in school to begin with? Finally, the sister's story involves her sneaking out of class to play hooky and go shopping. She comes across a little alien robot and needs to get it back to the mothership. At this point, the story tries to kind of circle back around and tie everything together. For the most part, it does a pretty good job and it leaves you just a little less confused. The graphics are pretty typical for the PlayStation. Somewhat clunky polygons that are good enough in identifying what everything is supposed to be. The music is alright, taking the form of some punky ska sounding stuff. One thing that I thought was neat was many of the minigame titles are parodies of popular movies at the time. There's also a lot of visual nods to classic movies and pop culture as well. At the end of the game, the family celebrates Grandma's birthday, and they probably don't even mention anything to each other about the absolute insanity they all encounter. Just another day, I guess. Incredible Crisis is an interesting and bizarre journey. The gameplay never gets incredibly deep, but some of what's here can be quite enjoyable, even if it only serves as a brief diversion from time to time. You can get your own copy for around $12. I give it a 6.5. Dig Dug for the Atari 2600. I know what you're thinking. Danny, Dig Dug is a timeless classic adored by millions. Yeah, well, I mean it is, but when you really think about it, Dig Dug is a freaking weird game. You play as Neil Armstrong and Evil Knievel's love child, and you walk into the earth. Vertically. You can just walk straight through. Hey, screw your ground, I'm walking in! The main point of the game is to eradicate all these little monster guys. What's interesting is they can turn into floating eyeballs that are capable of passing right through solid matter. This is the best part, though. To dispatch these strange half-solid, half-ethereal enemies, you... inflate them with the bike pump until they explode. Yeah, that's not weird at all. Each stage is completed when you destroy all the monsters on the screen. Well, sometimes one escapes, but it lets you move on to the next stage anyway. That's really all there is to the game. Being that it's a port of an arcade game, that's about all there has to be to it. The graphics are pretty colorful for the 2600 standards, and it's straightforward in presentation. All of the enemies are displayed to you right off the bat, giving you a without a doubt direction that's easy to understand, even for people who've never played the game before. And that's the mark of a good arcade game. 
though it is a classic, I probably wouldn't put this on my top 10 arcade game list, but it's still fun in small doses. The Atari 2600 version goes for a low price of $8. This one scores a 6. I finally get to talk about Monster Party on the NES. This odd platformer by Bandai was actually going to be the subject of my first review. Had the script written and everything, but someone literally did a review right before I started putting it all together. But it paid off because you get to hear about it now. You play as Mark, an average kid heading home from his ball game. Suddenly, a winged monster falls from the sky. He's all like, yo, come and help me take back my home planet from evil monsters. And you're all, but I'm scared. And he's all, but you gotta bet. So the monster whisks you away and force fuses with you. Isn't this the kind of thing you usually need to give consent for? Mark controls pretty well. You can jump, swing your bat, and even creep around on the ground like a worm. That's a useful skill, man. Naturally, the bat is your main attack. You can hit enemies with it or use it to reflect their own projectiles. You can play as the monster when you collect this pill icon. Not sure why they made it a pill exactly, but okay. When in monster form, you can fly by tapping the jump button and you can shoot projectiles of your own. Pew, 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 pew. The graphics are okay in this one. Nothing super fancy, and at a first glance it looks like a normal game. But then you reach this point in the first stage and... Oh god, what have I gotten myself into? What the hell is that thing? There's all sorts of weird enemies in this game, ranging from your standard skeletons and demons to... Umbrella bats? Ghost pants? Alligators? Oh, okay, well maybe that last one isn't so far-fetched. As bizarre as some of the enemies are, the boss enemies are where this game really shines. Here you see me fighting against a giant fried shrimp. After beating it, it turns into an onion ring. And then a fried kebab. There are so many strange bosses in this game, and there are usually two to three bosses per stage. However, there is one boss who is so scary, so fearsome, so demented that you will never forget him. Your soul will shriek a thousand times for all eternity simply from casting your eyes on him. And he utters, quite possibly, my favorite bit of dialogue in any video game ever. Sorry, I'm dead. This game clearly doesn't take itself very serious at all, and that's a great thing. There's eight stages to go through, and they all take the form of some similar backdrops. Caves, forests, pyramids, and so on. There's not much in the way of music here, mainly simple tunes that repeat in short loops. None of it's offensive or anything, though the shrieking sound of the haunted house in stage 6 about gives me a headache. There's a decent challenge factor in some of the later stages of the game. However, I find the difficulty balanced overall. Pound for Pound, this is a pretty good title, and in recent years it's grown in popularity, becoming somewhat of a cult classic. Buy your copy today for $12 and give it a go. I rank this one at a comfortable 7.5. Earthworm Jim. Earthworm Jim is probably the most well-known title featured in this episode. This is a run-and-gun style action platformer released on multiple systems. I have the Super Nintendo version, so that's what I'll be covering. You play as Jim, a badass earthworm with a fancy power suit. Jim can shoot enemies with his rapid-fire gun, but you never see any bullets come out of it. Jim can also use his head as a whip. This attack is a bit harder to aim, but obviously you can do it indefinitely since, unlike the gun, it doesn't require any ammo. You can also latch onto hooks to reach certain areas with this attack. It takes a bit to get the timing down, though. Sometimes you'll get a power-up for your gun and you'll be able to shoot a pretty nasty laser shot. The shots are very limited, though, so you need to be careful not to waste them. Jim controls pretty well for the most part, but I really can't understand why you don't have the option to shoot while in the air. It almost feels like something that was overlooked rather than a design choice. Either way, it'd be nice to have. The enemies vary by level. In the junkyard stage, there are crows and rabid dogs. In the hell, er, <coughs> excuse me, heck stage, you deal with these demon ghosts and lawyers. Okay, that's pretty clever. At the end of each stage, there's a wacky end boss. This guy must really have some serious gastrointestinal issues by the look of how many whole fish he keeps burping up. Remember kids, chew your food. In between platforming segments, you have the Andy Asteroid stages, where you race through a wormhole against Psycro, who I assume is your nemesis. You need to avoid the asteroids and grab the boost icons when you can. I'm not sure what all these orbs do, but I tried to grab as many as I could. If you get to the end before Psychroed, you get to move on to the next stage. 
if he beats you, though, you need to fight him. I took a lot of damage in these segments, so it's best just to beast out on the asteroid stages to avoid it altogether. This game can be pretty tough at times, like this part in level 3 where you need to steer this glass subtype vehicle to the next section of underwater pipes. You only have so long to do it before it breaks, and it's really hard not to bump into stuff, which will cause it to crack. I wasn't able to get past this part of the game. I know, I suck. Truth be told, though everyone was all about this game in the 90s, I've never really seen it as anything more than average. It's not phenomenal, but not terrible by any means. Still a decently fun game, and one you very well might enjoy more than I do. You can get it for about $25. I give this one a 6.5. Stretch Panic. Stretch Panic on the PlayStation 2 is a really interesting title for sure. This is the story of Linda, a young girl with 12 sisters. A mysterious package is delivered to their house, and out pops 13 demons that suck all the girls into a sketchy, purgatory-style dimension. Linda wakes up and finds out that all 12 of her sisters, due to their vanity, have been possessed by the demons. Linda, who is actually a good person, is not possessed. Rather, the 13th demon found a host in Linda's scarf. This is the main play mechanic of the game. You can use the demon scarf to grab and pull at enemies and the environment around you. You can do a little pinch for minimal damage, or you can grab and move the joystick around a lot and make Linda spring up and do a body slam. Naturally, the latter does more damage. This game, at its core, is basically just a bunch of boss fights. You need to defeat your 12 vain sisters to exercise the demons possessing them. Some of these fights are pretty intense, but others are kind of basic. The view sucks in this game, and the camera controls are pretty awful. Luckily, there's a lock-on targeting system, which is a real lifesaver when pinching your sisters to death. You can't just go on a rampage taking them all out, though. Oh no. Each sister is tucked away behind a door. These doors require a certain amount of points to access them, indicated by a number on the door itself. Super Mario 64 style. To get these points, you need to defeat the enemies in the EX areas. These enemies... to beat these busty ladies to get those door points. What's really silly is what happens if one of them falls off a platform. The graphics overall are pretty good, and I kind of like the sketchy style of the hub world. The music is okay, but doesn't really stand out or anything. As I said before, the controls are pretty hard to get used to, especially for the camera. When I first started playing, I doubt that I'd be able to play for long because of it, but once I got used to the funky control scheme, I really started to enjoy myself. Stretch Panic is fun overall, and it's pretty cheap. You can add this odd game to your collection for roughly 12 bucks for a complete copy. I give it a 7. Well, there you have it, guys. Just a small selection of weird games. Are there any bizarre or odd games that you've played? Have you played any of the games I covered in this episode? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you so much for watching, and stay tuned to see what D-Pad Danny does next.